Yes, welcome everybody to this, the first installment of McMaster's Philosophy Talks, Pondering the Pandemic. Um, my name is James Sikama. I will be your host. I will be moderating the discussion. I teach philosophy here at McMaster University, where I've done so for the past four years. I also teach philosophy in elementary classrooms to children and after school programs as part of my Philosophy for Children program, Project Y. So welcome, hearty welcome to you, wherever you may be. And you're here because, well, we're in very strange times. We find ourselves in very critical times, very much a crisis, and we're doing philosophy. That's pretty strange. So why are we doing philosophy in a crisis? Well, Epicurus, one of the philosophers we'll be encountering tonight, said, quote, we must not pretend to study philosophy, but study it in reality, for it is not the appearance of health that we need, but real health. What is real health? And what, is, what has philosophy of all things to do with it? Well, I suppose that's why we're all here tonight. We wonder whether or not we'll be okay whether or not we'll ever get back to normal and not the new normal but normal normal whether we can make a living whether our children will enjoy a learning environment actually conducive to learning this fall all of these wonders have one thing in common they are all instigated by this crisis and so with all due respect to plato i don't think philosophy finds its origin in wonder I think it is rather crisis where philosophy and philosophical thought finds its point of inception. Where philosophical thought concerns itself with critical times and critical problems and the questions that are enunciated in relation to it. Namely, things like how should we understand viruses in relation to us? Is a virus an enemy? Is it evil? Can we be at war with the, something like a virus? What should we do about it? And can we be certain? And to what extent can we be certain? And how does that affect the decisions that we make? And how should we manage risk? And for what purpose? What makes a life worth living? What should be sacrificed for what? Is health absolutely valuable? And if so, why were so many willing to risk health in order to protest racism in the la and police brutality in the last few weeks? Is death the worst that can befall us? What makes a problem problematic for us is that it unsettles what we thought had been settled unearthed the ground we were walking on, so to speak. Though history is replete with examples to the contrary, we could scarcely imagine our lives could be upended so dramatically in such a short span of time. And now we are forced to ask these questions anew or perhaps for the first time. And so we're glad that you're here with us to ask these questions or there or wherever you're here may be. And we're glad that you're here to ponder the pandemic with us and you're cordially invited to think along with us. So please, we're doing philosophy together. And what we want is for you to pose questions to us. So hit that Q&A uh, button and ask that question. I will be looking at that as, uh, as our panelists are, are speaking and hopefully we can pose a number of questions to them. Uh, and without further ado, let's introduce these panelists to you. First is Mark Johnstone. He teaches philosophy in the department here at McMaster University where he has worked for the past 10 years. His research focuses mainly on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy with a special focus on ancient theories of ethics and psychology. He holds a PhD in classical philosophy from Princeton University and is originally from New Zealand. Daniel Corin also teaches philosophy here and uh, in, 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 at McMaster and in the arts and science department in their, in their program. He has been here for but a year, um, fresh out of, uh, off of a PhD from 
the University of Colorado Boulder. His research focus is on contemporary ethics and ancient Greek philosophy, with a special focus on theories of action and moral responsibility. He originally hails from Toronto and made sure that I said, go Raptors go. So without further ado, let me get into one of the first things that these two thought uh, it would be wise to speak about, and that is the topic of friendship. Now, it's no surprise that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has upended many aspects of our lives, from how we work, to how we shop, how we live in our homes and move in public spaces, how we relate to ourselves and others. And this last item has, perhaps, been one of the most fundamentally altered. In a word, our friendships have been forced to move from direct, in-person, physical interactions to virtual meetings through the aperture of the computer screen. Given our apparent interest in cultivating, uh, relation, in, in cultivating friendships, rather, usage on video conferencing platforms has doubled during the pandemic. So while many of the pre-pandemic activities we thought helpful for cultivating a good life have been put on hold, we weren't willing for friendship to be one of them. Why? For example, in his Principal Doctrines, Epicurus states, quote, of all the things which wisdom acquires to produce the blessedness of the complete life, far the greatest is the possession of friendship. So I pose to you, Mark and Daniel, how important is friendship for living a good life? Thank you, James. And uh, thanks to the Center of, for Continuing Education and McMaster Alumni for organizing this session and James for all the work you put into organizing this. Uh, and it's wonderful to see so many people here and it's great to be involved. Uh, so I'm really glad the session is starting with the topic of friendship because it is a topic that's very salient for a lot of us right now. Uh, both because the ordinary ways in which we interact with our friends have been interrupted. Some of us have been cut off from friends, unable to travel to see them. And also because a lot of us have been forced to rely on our friends in, in, in new ways and have um, found new depth and value perhaps in some of our existing friendships. So my brief is to talk about Aristotle on uh, the topic of friendship and I'll do so for about five minutes uh, and then I'll hand over to Daniel. Uh, so the prompt is um, how important is friendship for living a good life according to the ancient Greek philosophers? And the short answer to this question, in Aristotle's case at least, is very important. Uh, so at the beginning of his uh, discussion of friendship in the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, arguably the most influential and famous book of moral philosophy ever written, uh, Aristotle remarks uh, that um, no one would choose to live without friends, even if he had all of the other goods. And indeed, Aristotle, uh, marking the importance he assigns to friendship, dedicates a full uh, two uh, of the ten books of the Nicomachean Ethics to this topic. So 20% of this work is dedicated to the topic of friendship. And this is a sharp contrast uh, between Aristotle and a lot of more recent ethical theories, within which friendship plays a much more marginal uh, role if it gets discussed at all. So what is friendship for Aristotle? Well, uh, first of all, uh, according to Aristotle, friendship is reciprocated goodwill of which both parties are aware. So when I have goodwill towards someone, I want good things for the other person and I want good things for the other person for their sake. Uh, but it's not enough for a friendship to exist that I merely want good things for the other person. They have to want good things for me too. And not only that, but we need to both be aware of this mutual well-wishing in order for a friendship to be constituted. After all, we might both wish good things for the other person, but not know anything about our, our, our wishes for each other. Uh, so Aristotle thought that there are three main bases for friendship, uh, because there are three main causes of goodwill towards other people. And they are utility, pleasure, and goodness, or goodness of character. And as a result, there are three main kinds of friendships, utility friendships, pleasure friendships, and what Aristotle calls virtue friendships, or sometimes simply 
friendships of goodness. Now, utility friendships are important because they provide us with things we want and need, things that are useful. Pleasure friendships are good because they provide us with pleasure. We enjoy spending time with people and sometimes we like them for that reason. But the kind of friendship with which Aristotle, in which Aristotle was most interested in is the third kind, which he calls virtue friendship or goodness friendship. Uh, and this is the kind of friendship we have with other people because we have goodwill towards them, because we recognize some good feature in their character. There's something good about them and we love that about them. Uh, so why is friendship important for Aristotle? Well, focusing on this final kind of friendship, I think there are three main answers. I'm going to run through them very briefly. First, uh, Aristotle thought that our friends are worthy partners for us in life's projects and endeavors. So compare the situation where you're doing something you enjoy on your own, and then the situation where you're doing that same thing with your friends. And there's something about doing it together as part of a group that enhances uh, the value of that activity for us. And Aristotle recognized how uh, joint activity can be enhanced and more pleasurable as a result of doing it with friends. Second, our friends provide us with uh, the context and opportunity to act well in the full variety of ways in which uh, we are human, exercising the full variety of capacities that make us human. So it's only in the context of building and maintain, maintaining friendships, especially those most valuable kind, that we get to exercise the full range of the human virtues. And that's the second reason why friendship was so important for Aristotle. And the third and final reason why friendship was important uh, for Aristotle is that our friends help us to know ourselves better. So in a way, we see ourselves reflected in our friends and, and in their reactions to us, according to Aristotle, we can better appreciate our strengths and we can learn about our weaknesses. And by learning about ourselves through our friends, uh, we can uh, perhaps become better people ourselves. That's all from me. Thanks, uh, Mark, and uh, thanks, James, and thanks to all of you for attending this webinar and thanks to the other organizers as well. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about uh, the Epicureans on friendship. <coughs> So uh, Mark just spoke to you very nicely about Aristotle. The Epicurean school is generally known as an Hellenistic school of philosophy. It just means it came later on. So Aristotle is back in the fourth century. You see uh, the Epicureans and Stoics, other Hellenistic schools are coming much later. And in some ways they are aware of ideas such as the ones Mark has just nicely described for you. Um, and they respond to them. Uh, they accept some of them and reject others. So the Epicureans are known as hedonists. This comes from the Greek word hedone, which means pleasure. This can mean one of two main things. As a hedonist, you might think that all that's good is pleasure. You also might think that uh, all that's pleasure is good. You might think that there are no good things other than pleasurable things, than pleasure itself. The Epicureans tend to accept both of these claims, that the good things are, well, pleasures, and all the pleasures are good things. Uh, but they don't accept the claim that all pleasures ought to be pursued. Uh, this is a really important uh, difference. I'll come back to this in, in a minute. They also think that all pain is bad. All the, all the painful experiences are bad. And all the bad things are painful, uh, are, are, are pains. Uh, but they don't think that all pain should be avoided. So we, you can think about this in terms of sort of six big points we've got already on the table here, right? So all the good things are pleasures, all the pleasurable things are good, all the painful things are bad, all the bad things are pain. But then we've got these two interesting claims that seem to be intention that not all pleasure should be pursued and not all pain should be avoided. What this comes down to is that for the Epicureans, prudence or practical decision-making is crucial. That's what tells us when you ought to endure some pain or ought to avoid some pleasure. Because without prudence, we would just haphazardly pursue whatever pleasure is there for us and avoid whatever seems painful in the moment. So, for example, if wearing a mask 
uh, so as not to get other people sick potentially. Uh, maybe just an example for others. If that's a little bit of a, of a nuisance, the Epicureans might say, still you ought to endure that pain because it'll lead to future pleasure for you. By setting an example for others to wear masks themselves, you might argue uh, you're more likely to have a pleasurable existence in your own community. Um, so setting, a, setting an, an example in that way. So that's kind of the, the long story short for the Epicureans. That's what they're all about. And when it comes to friendship, this gets applied. So the Epicureans think that friendship is vital, but the explanation will always end with the following point. It's important because it's going to maximize your own pleasure down the line, minimize your pain down the line. And we're going to interact with this point a little bit more later on, but I'll just say very quickly now, for the Epicureans, friendship uh, still, you, you want to pursue it, you, you want to sacrifice a great deal for friendship, uh, even though ultimately the, the goal is always to uh, maximize your own pleasure. So you want to, for example, help a friend move on a Saturday, even if you'd rather not, maybe not in the present times, but you want to go ahead and do that um, because that's a way to cultivate the friendship, to make the friendship uh, sort of a sound basis for the friend having your back later on, helping you move or whatever the case is later on. Or maybe you're gonna Zoom with a friend, you can't interact in person, let's say, or you're uh, wary of doing that in the current circumstances, you decide, okay, I'll zoom at a time more appropriate, more convenient for you, less convenient for me. And the hope is that down the line, they will reciprocate. So these sorts of things the Epicureans will say we very much ought to do. Uh, the, the Epicureans were particularly fond of community. So on their account, it's true that pleasure is always good, it's not as good as pleasure and so on, how to avoid pain. And you might think that makes us sound like an island. It doesn't, it's the Epicureans. Uh, we ought to live together. They were known, that the first Epicureans in, in their school, they were known as the Garden. Uh, the Garden was the, the name for their um, founding school in contrast with the Academy uh, from, um, so that's housing Aristotle and Plato and others. And in the Garden, uh, there was kind of an emphasis on living according to nature, living with each other, living as a community. Um, and friendship played a crucial role there. It's as much as I'll say for now. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you both Mark and Daniel. Uh, boy, a, a, a flurry of questions have, uh, have been coming in. I don't know that I'll be able to get to all of them, um, but uh, one of the things uh, that, was, uh, that has, was asked it was, um, well, what impact, uh, or let, let's ask this, uh, Arif asked this question, do you think that social media could replace actual contacting of people? So I'll pose that to, you know, to, the, to either of you. Do you, think that, do you think that social media could actually replace contacting of people? What would Aristotle or Epicurus say about that? Could we get still true or virtuous friendship from, uh, from just social media interaction? Well, I think there are two questions. Can you form new friendships and can you sustain existing friendships? I think it's a lot easier to do the latter in a virtual environment than it is to form new friendships. Um, one of the things Aristotle emphasizes, at least in the, uh, when talking about friendship, is the idea of sharing your life with another person, the idea of spending time with the other person. And he thinks these are essential to friendships, to, at least to really deep kind of true friendships as he thinks about it. And those things are a little challenging uh, today in a lot of people's situations. Um, we're interacting with friends over Zoom or Skype or whatever we're using uh, over Facebook or other social media in much more limited ways. And so um, it's, I think, enough to sustain a friendship through a long period of time, perhaps. Um, but in terms of forming new friendships, maybe it's a little bit more challenging. It certainly is not the kind of interaction we would ideally like to be having with our friends. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, how, how might Epicurus respond to social media friendship? I say, uh, for, for Epicurus, you ought to avoid Twitter at all costs. No, um, <laughs> I, I think the Epicureans would say, look, if, if you can cultivate the kind of uh, 
relationships that you need um, to long-term sustain you know, your uh, reliable pleasures and uh, minimize your pain, the sorts of friendships that you would cultivate in uh, ordinary life, then of course, and if that is your main way to do it as you know, the only uh, viable option, then yeah, definitely go for it. Um, I suppose they might encourage us to live according to nature, specifically to use not just one avenue, but potentially others as well. So more concretely, how would this pan out? It's like maybe a phone call, a Zoom call, not just a social media interaction, um, combine different modalities. Um, Epicurus does have a long treatise on, uh, a series of treaties on, on Zoom. He doesn't, um, it's a bad joke, but uh, I think that's what they would advise. We should combine different modalities. Okay, uh, thank you. Folks, uh, I realize that uh, a number of your questions aren't getting, uh, aren't getting raised. Um, my hope is that they, they stay there and that uh, they'll be available um, for, for us to, to keep the conversation going. Perhaps we can set up a, a discussion board afterwards and, and we'll do our best to, to answer those questions. But we, we, for the sake of time, I think we have to move on at this, at this point. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just ask this because in connection with, th there is a question here on the, the, uh, how human action interaction is essential to survival, but we're experiencing this re really grave state of, of loneliness or, or were in the, in the, uh, the more, more severe stages of the lockdown. And that the, the question there is like, well, can loneliness act as some kind of, uh, Def, uh, defense against isolation, or can uh, can friendship ask, uh, act as this defense against isolation? Um, but then they're asking, well, does loneliness have this this role as well? But certainly, this this feeling of loneliness was one of the hardships that we we in, uh, encountered. And so, uh, let's go. Well, I'll go back to Epicurus, who, who, who Epicurus who said, all friendship is desirable in itself, though it starts from the need of help. So given that we experienced such loneliness and, and that we were willing to try to reach out as much as possible, how does friendship help us with hardship? So Mark uh, I think described uh, that there are three kinds of uh, friendships for, for Aristotle. There's utility-based, pleasure-based, and virtue-based. Um, so I think this is a pretty familiar idea that there are three kinds of ways we might be friends with someone else. Uh, it might be you, know, you, you get something practical out of the friendship. There is something that they give to you. Let's say you'd help with uh, doing some uh, project, whether it's for work or for school, and this person is just remarkably good at Excel. And the sorts of things that would give you a headache for three hours just flows naturally for them. Well, that might be the kind of person you want to develop a friendship with. So a second kind of pleasure, you get something out of it, more like a laugh. You enjoy it. You enjoy hanging out with the person. Their, their company is, is pleasurable for you. And virtue-based. The idea here is in this third kind of, friend, this third kind of friendship, this is, if you like, the, um, what's, what gets referred to as the real kind of friendship um, for Aristotle. This is where the friends care about each other, something like for the sake, just for the sake of that friend. They just They, they love that person. Um, not for the sake of what they get out of the person, not for the sake of um, you know, get, getting just getting a laugh. Of course, it's compatible with this to laugh with a person. But uh, in any case, I, I think you can see how this third kind of friendship, the virtue-based friendship, is one that's going to help us out a bit more with um, encountering hardship. Uh, it, of course, it would be nice to have a laugh to, to get pleasure out of your virtue-based friendship, and that's something that might help you through, through hardship. Uh, but if you care about the friend just for his or her own sake, well, that, that seems like the kind of friendship that will withstand um, inconvenience, even very serious um, difficulties and challenges that you might face, might help you out of, for example, being isolated uh, if you're focused not just on um, your own challenges, but also on uh, somebody else's um, affairs and, and trying to help them overcome challenges as well, maybe getting some satisfaction out of helping them as well. Uh, you might also wonder how the first two kinds of friendship in a state of hardship 
might develop into a virtue-based friendship. So it might very well start out, and this is something I talk about often with my students teaching this sort of thing, that you, you get something out of the friendship concrete, that's why it seems to be there. Um, and maybe you enjoy it as well, hang out with the person. But that might develop over time into a virtue-based friendship, right? Turn into a friendship that's more characterized by caring about the friend for his or her own sake. So the first two kinds might turn into the third kind and hardship, you might say, will help to bring that about um, by forcing us to spend more time with the person. I mean, I can just say, I, during this pandemic, um, so I, I have started talking to people, Zooming with people I haven't talked to in a long time. It's been a while since I've interacted with them. And uh, some of them have found out they um, can't stand my company at all. Others, have, we, I think we've found that there is something there we're going to try to develop, um, you know, we'll hang out with each other on a regular basis. And yeah, so I think that's something that Aristotle would, would recommend. Uh, I'll just uh, close here just with two very quick points for Aristotle. I think that might provoke some discussion and thought. So just the first is for Aristotle, wit is an important virtue. Uh, this doesn't seem like a natural point, I think, in some contexts today. We think of virtues like courage, temperance, prudence, generosity. But being funny, witty, uh, being funny in the right ways at the right times with respect to the appropriate objects, that's not something that I think we normally think of as a virtue, but it's an important one for Aristotle. Being gregarious in the right ways, the right times, um, with, res with respect to the appropriate objects is, um, is, is virtuous for Aristotle. It's, it's actually quite important for being a successful, happy human being. And you might say that hardship might bring out some more wit. And then just the second little point here for Aristotle, it's not only true that you can have friendship amidst hardship, but it's actually for, for him, it's the case that if your friend goes and wins the lottery, you, the, the friendship might be over. Um, he has a curious claim uh, in his account of friendship where he actually says that if your friend has a life more like that of the gods, the friendship is gone. Now uh, you can't be friends with the person anymore. You have to be on something like uh, a human, mortal, somewhat level playing field to be friends. And if you're both going through the same sorts of hardships in a pandemic, that's that might actually help to sustain or at least develop the friendship. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. So uh, I'm going to take five minutes on Epicurus. So Daniel and I are swapping over uh, thinkers and schools and we're both going to get to the Stoics. Uh, a little bit later on as well. Uh, so Epicurus, uh, so the question is, uh, again, uh, how does friendship help us deal with hardship, according to the ancient Greek philosophers? Uh, so Epicurus, uh, as Daniel already mentioned, um, praises friendship in very strong terms. Friendship is an immortal good. Uh, it, quote, uh, dances around the world, announcing to us all that we should wake to blessedness. This is from the Vatican sayings by Epicurus. Um, so friendship makes us happy, it contributes to our, to our happiness. And uh, so to understand how friendship can help us in hardship, uh, I think it's helpful to get a clearer grip on um, how Epicurus and his followers understood the goal and understood what makes us happy. So as Daniel already uh, noted, uh, for the Epicureans, uh, what makes us happy is pleasure. It's the only thing that matters uh, in the end, and the goal is to live as pleasantly as possible. Uh, but what they recommended was not a life of luxury and extravagance lived in pursuit of intense, sensual pleasures, as we might imagine, but rather a rather simple life, quite austere in some ways. Uh, and to understand why, it's useful to think about how they thought about desire. So the Epicureans thought that unsatisfied desire was painful. Uh, it's painful because it's frustrating not to get what you want, and it's painful because you might worry that you're going to be able to get what you want or that you're going to continue to have it. And their recommended response to this was not, you know, accumulate vast numbers of resources, enormous wealth, so you can buy whatever you want, but rather to limit your desires. And so the Epicureans recommended living a life in which you limit your desires to things that are readily attainable, um, food, shelter, um, clothing, uh, 
friends, uh, right? Uh, but, um, and, and that you don't get overly hang up on things society tells you are valuable, things like fashion and fame and great wealth. Uh, and the goal uh, ultimately for the Epicureans is to achieve what they called ataraxia. So that can be roughly translated as tranquility or maybe peace of mind. And so uh, the question is, how do friends help us in cases of hardship? Uh, and the answer is you know, in three main ways. Uh, so the first is that our friends provide us with material assistance. So uh, let's say we have to self-quarantine for a while after an exposure to, 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 to COVID-19. Uh, our friends might be able to drop off food or other things we need to prevent us having to leave the house and just drop it off at our doorstep. Um, there might be all kinds of things we need as a result of this crisis and our friends can provide us with those things. Um, in a variety of situations in life, not just talking about the virus now, of course, our friends help us to get the things we want and need uh, to continue our lives and to live well in our lives. So material assistance is the first kind of thing our friends provide. Uh, second, uh, friends provide us with intellectual assistance. So one thing our friends can do for us is they can help us, at least as Epicurus saw it, um, keep a firm grasp on the key precepts of their philosophy. So, for example, um, they can remind us that uh, when we are undergoing hardship, uh, that it's not going to last forever, that these times will pass, right? This applies both to temporary pain and also to deprivation that might last several months. It will pass. And the Epicureans say your friends can remind you that uh, bad things, that painful things will pass. Uh, they can also remind us that things that ultimately make us happy are easy to acquire if we can limit our desires in the way I just mentioned and focus on the things that really are crucial to our lives. Um, we'll realize that, you know, we don't need a lot of the things that we've become accustomed to having, but they don't, they don't matter when it really comes to the crunch. And that's another thing our friends can remind us of. In addition, our friends can direct our attention uh, away from our present uh, hardships and towards good things, both in our past and in our future, can help us focus our attention uh, in ways that are less psychologically grueling. And finally, the Epicureans uh, say our friends can remind us that um, some of the major sources of our anxiety, including in their case, and they believe this, our own deaths, uh, are, are, are nothing to, to be greatly feared. Third, and perhaps most importantly for the Epicureans, uh, we know that when we have friends, uh, we can count on them in times of need. And so, because of that, they help us, not only in those times of need, but also when things are going well, because they give us confidence that should things go pear-shaped, <laughs> should things go wrong, uh, that they're there to help us in all of the ways just mentioned, and that knowing that they're there to help us in these ways gives us peace of mind and contributes to our tranquility, our ataraxia, which is, uh, for Epicurus and his followers, uh, the goal of a happy life. Thank you. Thank you both Mark and Daniel. Uh, as with the last time, we have a number of questions. Uh, Daniel, you mentioned uh, the sort of, you, you got in contact with some other people, um, but the, you, know, you quickly realized some friendships ended. We have a question um, of uh, precisely this. Uh, we might have reevaluated re friendships at this time, is there any way uh, what you, uh, that there's an appropriate way or virtuous way to end a friendship? And how do, how do friendships end? Does that necessarily lead to enemies? How might both Aristotle or Epicurus think of, uh, of enemies? So Aristotle was uh, firmly against uh, texting to end friendships. No, he, he thought that um, we should end friendships. Um, well, for a number of reasons. One reason might be... Uh, if it's the pleasure-based friendship, the pleasure isn't there anymore. If it's utility-based, the utility isn't there anymore. That is, you don't get a laugh anymore out of hanging out with a person or there isn't the use anymore. But in the virtue-based friendship, well, the thing is for Aristotle, virtue is something stable. It doesn't just come on Tuesdays and gone by the Wednesday. Virtue is something that's there for keeps. And it's something that uh, virtuous people will sort of recognize uh, and caring about the person for his or her own sake is something that's you know, relatively um, stable. Um, of course, there might be you know, reasons to not be friends anymore, or just simply it might be, not be possible 
um, to friends anymore or whatever the case is. Uh, but in general, Aristotle's advice is going to be something like, well, uh, if you have to actively end the friendship, but you don't just want to let it phase out naturally on its own, do it in a way that's using reason, which he thinks is the characteristic function of human beings. It's what makes us human, um, our, our reasoning capacity. Apply it uh, in, the, in the right way at the right time, the right objects, um, and aiming at quite literally, Tom Ezon, the, the middle, uh, the mean between excess and deficiency in whatever you're talking about. So um, to make this a little less wordy, uh, don't go over the top, don't use more uh, force than you have to with any of the friendship, um, but don't just sort of be too um, allowing and just let the friend or the, the person do whatever they want in that, in that situation. So uh, yeah, I think that's generally going to be Aristotle's advice. I'm not sure how helpful that is, but that's what I would think. Thank you. Um, just uh, and then before we move on here, um, I'll pose this, and maybe Mark, you can you can weigh in on this. Um, someone asks: Are utility-based friendships? Do those are those the types of things that might lead to discrimination? This sort of us versus them, or how might we think of friendships in the in terms of an in-group and an out-group? Um, and can Aristotle or Epicurus say something about how we might want to bridge that and, and become friends with uh, those who we seem to be opposed to? Uh, so I don't think uh, utility-based friendships need have this kind of effect. So the, the idea behind a utility-based friendship is that, you know, you, 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 you get something from each other initially. So um, it, might, it might be the relationship you have with your hairdresser or something like that. And a friendship kind of grows up around that kind of exchange of mutual interests, uh, right? So you develop affection for the other person. Um, but if you didn't need to get your hair cut anymore, like some of now, or you change hairdressers, you, that relationship wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't continue to survive. Um, you know, I think uh, there's, there's nothing in Aristotle's account, or I think in Epicurus's, that uh, makes it the case that people can't form all three kinds of friendship Aristotle distinguishes across all kinds of barriers, right? So uh, all that is necessary to get this going is this very pure feeling of goodwill towards the other party. And this feeling of goodwill has one of these three causes. So the other party provides you with something useful to you. The other party's fun to hang around with, pleasant. You enjoy their company. And the other party's a good person and you recognize that in them. And um, I, I take it human beings are capable of recognizing goodness in other people of all, of all different, from all different backgrounds and of all stripes. Uh, thank you very much. I just want, uh, I want to pose this question because I think it's a significant one and, and one that uh, certainly Aristotle uh, considers since he thinks virtue is neither for, uh, from nature nor against it. Uh, we all are capable of it. So uh, when Anne asks, do you think that parents should be teaching their children how to be a friend? Given the decreased amount of time all people actually interact with others for the purpose of friendship, knowing how to have a friend and be a good friend, that's not necessarily innate. Um, how might Aristotle or Epicurus teach another how to be a good friend and, and perhaps a child at that? Um, I think that's a fantastic question, first of all. Um, and uh, just take a quick stab at trying to answer it. So I think uh, for Aristotle, having the correct or having a, a good upbringing is really important. Um, there are sort of different views on this among people who, like me, who kind of spend inordinate amounts of time reading Aristotle, but uh, sort of the, the long story short is some people think that for Aristotle, if you don't have a good upbringing, you can't really become a happy, flourishing, good human being, um, where obviously I'm running together happiness and goodness. Um, and other people think that, well, basically the, the opposite. Um, no, you, you can. I think both parties would agree that for Aristotle, the right kind of upbringing is just crucial. Everything from having uh, good friendships to um, having the sort of career that you want to have. And um, so that's rather general, but the, the, the right kind of upbringing is gonna be crucial. To, does that involve teaching friendship? Is, is being taught how to be a good friend necessary for having uh, a good friendship. I'm not sure if you'd be committed to that claim, but you'd certainly say that if you've been given the wrong teaching, the wrong advice, the wrong role models the whole way through, 
it's, it is just going to make it much more difficult um, to have a good friendship, uh, to certainly to have the kind of virtue-based friendship that he's really into um, and, and um, describes in some detail. So basically, no, I, I'm, I'm not sure he would say it's necessary to be taught how to be a good friend, but yes, I think he'd say it's really important not to have the bad, like confusing, misleading teaching and role models. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll move on, <laughs> given uh, our sensitivity to time here. Um, so we'll move on into a bit of different, uh, different territory at this moment. So whether with or, or without friends, we have certainly had to deal with hardships. So we, we just were speaking about how friends might help us deal with hardships, but it seems to be quite obvious that we have had to deal with some hardships and in some cases undue hardships or, or certainly ones that we didn't anticipate ever having to deal with. We've had to do a lot of unpleasant things like maybe getting tested and wearing a mask when it's 40 degrees out, uh, maintaining social distancing, working from home, or perhaps not being able to work at all, sheltering in place and thereby avoiding bars and pubs, restaurants, shops, and we're, we've been kept from enjoying many of the, th of the things that we might think make up a pleasant life. Question is, why have we been willing to avoid such pleasures? For egoistic reasons, perhaps? Well, we wish to avoid getting sick ourselves. We want to stay healthy ourselves. Or perhaps for altruistic reasons, we do not want to get others sick. We have the sense that we have responsibility to them. Is it somehow both egoism and altruism? So I pose that to you. All right, so I'll start this one off and uh, I am uh, talking about Aristotle again. So I'm, I'm glad this topic's um, come up. Uh, part of, uh, to my mind, part of what makes ancient ethics so interesting uh, is the way they thought about the relationship between self-interest and our concern for other people. So um, in modern ethics, uh, things are at least often presented in something like the following way. You have good reasons to do what is good for yourself. And so there are reasons of self-interest or prudential reasons. And you have reasons to do things for other people and their moral reasons, their other regarding reasons. And these will sometimes conflict, right? So you have a clash between morality and self-interest. Uh, but I think it's characteristic of all the major Greek ethical schools that they didn't see the demands of morality and the demands of self-interest as clashing in this way. Rather, they saw them as coinciding, pushing us in the same directions. So uh, in the case of Aristotle, uh, what's good for me? as a human being, according to Aristotle, is to live well as the kind of thing I am, as a human being. And what that requires is that I develop uh, my own character in such a way as to become a good person. Uh, so, and what that involves is that I develop my natural capacities and I ultimately cultivate the virtues. So the virtues uh, Daniel mentioned a few examples earlier, but things like courage and moderation and generosity and wisdom. And uh, so, uh, and one particularly important virtue for Aristotle was the one he called uh, phronesis, uh, which is usually translated as something like practical wisdom. And what phronesis does, uh, roughly speaking, is enable us to, when we're in a particular situation, maybe a novel situation, maybe something new, uh, to figure out uh, what, that's, what the factors in play are and to connect the particulars of the situation to my general understanding of what is good and why it's good, and thereby to discern what the situation calls for me to do. So what does this mean in concrete terms? Well, um, if I'm a virtuous person, an Aristotelian virtuous person, um, and there are these directives, maybe health department uh, directives to maintain social distancing, to wear a mask, uh, to stay home when I don't need to go out. Um, 
I won't, uh, insofar as I, I recognize these as reasonable and well-motivated uh, measures required by public health, uh, chafe against them or see them as uh, constraints imposed, you know, someone's telling me what to do. Uh, but um, rather I'll adhere to them because I, I can recognize that these are, under these difficult circumstances, these are uh, appropriate uh, things for me to do. And as a virtuous person, I'll, I'll recognize that. Um, sure, I miss going to the movie theater. I miss, you know, I don't like wearing a mask. It's not really nice. Um, but as a good person with practical wisdom, uh, I recognize that these are called for by the situation, so I do them willingly. And so, you know, to take a more, a more normal example, you know, if I'm an Aristotelian virtuous person, um, you know, I'll, I'll give to charity, not excessively, but not, not stingily, if my means allow. And I'll do so not grudgingly, feeling I'm sacrificing my self-interest, but rather as a manifestation of my good character. And having that good character is itself a part of what is in my own best interests. It's a realization of my nature as a human being and a, an exercise of my excellence as a human being to, 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 to do these kinds of things. Uh, in addition, uh, let me close by mentioning this, one of Aristotle's most famous ideas uh, is his claim that human beings are by nature political animals. This is in the first book of the politics. And what he means by that is not that, you know, we, we enjoy, uh, you know, getting on the campaign trail or sticking, you know, political yard signs or even voting in elections. It's not being political in that sense, but rather what he means is that human beings by nature uh, live in political communities, polis in the Greek, so independent city-states. Um, and what I sort of really had in mind is that it's part of human nature to live in communities and to work together as members of a community towards shared or common goals. And so um, the point again is that in doing this, I'm not sacrificing my interest, right? And working with others and, you know, you know, you hear a lot of people saying things like, we're all in this together and we need to pitch in there together, right? And so that's very, a very Aristotelian uh, thought in a way, because Aristotle thinks it's very natural for us to feel part of these broader groups and to sort of feel part of a community and to do things for the sake of the community as part of a common uh, or joint uh, exercise. Um, and so that, that's, that's, that's what he means when he says we're political animals and it is a um, manifestation of our nature to join with others and strive for, for the good of our communities as a whole. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about how Epicurus would answer this question. So you've already had a couple um, little spiels here about the Epicurean applications here, and I'm going to talk a bit about how the Epicureans would see our um, motivation for avoiding certain pleasures. Is it egoistic, that is, is it just self-driven, or is it altruistic, meaning something like, is it others-driven? It's just the mistake of others that we're avoiding these pleasures. And Mark, uh, I think, helpfully, um, have emphasized that in a lot of these ancient Greek schools of thought, there isn't always a very rigid separation between the ego egoistic motivations and what Mark called the, the moral motivations or the um, altruistic motivations. Um, I think this is largely true of the way that we think ordinarily now, today, um, in all, all kinds of contexts, religious, secular, and so on. That is, we think, all right, the reason that I'm doing something might be in part because it's for me. It might also be in part because it's for others. Why do you wear a mask? Well, we've been told it doesn't really protect you, you, you yourself a ton. Um, it's really more about protecting others. You're not, you know, speaking mostly on others and so on. Um, so you, you might say, but it's, it's also to set an example for others, as I mentioned earlier on. So we might say the motivation is both for yourself and for others. The Epicureans are always going to say that the answer ends with the following claim. It's for my own uh, pleasure and the minimization of my own pain. That's always going to end the explanation. But along the way, it's more complicated. Um, you might have to endure some pain uh, and uh, avoid some pleasures for the sake of maximizing uh, your own um, ideal hedonistic state, your pleasure. Uh, long term. So a wise person, Epicurus apparently said, would feel the torture of a friend no less than her own and would die for a friend rather than betray her for otherwise your own life 
would be confounded. So that's another of the Vatican sayings, I think, Mark, if you know them earlier on. Um, now this sounds awfully altruistic, and there's a, there's a live debate actually um, about whether the Epicurean count, account of uh, friendship is altruistic. Uh, is it the case that for the Epicureans, we ought to be friends with people, keep doing those Zoom calls at weird hours, despite the time difference, not because it's actually benefiting you in any way, but just because your friend has a kind of wonderful relief from his or her anxiety or depression, whatever the case is, isolation through those Zoom calls. Is it really that kind of altruistic motivation for the Epicureans? It's not really clear that's, that's true. You might still do those Zoom calls at awkward hours, you know, despite the time difference um, to help your friend out with anxiety or depression, whatever the case is. Um, ultimately, because that is going to maximize your own pleasure, ultimately. Um, so long story short here, just to give a kind of a more straightforward answer. Uh, no, I, I don't think the motivation on the Epicurean account is ever going to be strictly altruistic. It'll always be, I think, what we would call egoistic. It's going to be uh, because of your own pleasure state. But I think that's a bit different from saying the uh, motivation for all the actions is ultimately just selfish. So yes, in a sense, egoistic, but I wouldn't necessarily say purely selfish, the Epicureans. Thanks. Uh, thank you both. Um, so one question that came up earlier, but I think maybe more, uh, imp uh, more relevant now is this question of, well, how important is purpose or direction in living a good life? I think the connection here might be that if we are, in, uh, if we're motivated to do things ultimately on Epicurus's account because we we want to uh, derive pleasure from it, we want to avoid pain, or on Aristotle's account, well, we want to act uh, with practical wisdom uh, and judge a situation aright because that's precisely what the virtuous person would do. Um, still, what is the point of it? What is the purpose of uh, of doing that? What's the purpose still of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, could we judge on Aristotelian grounds that in this particular instance, you know, I, I would elect not to wear a mask because uh, perhaps for Epicurean reasons, then that eh, doesn't make me feel good. Uh, I, and that's that sort of hedonistic uh, impetus, that motivation. And yeah, does that give us what we want? How, so how important is purpose or direction in living a good life? Uh, so the ancient Greeks, the basic structure of all of the main ancient Greek ethical theories uh, is that you know, we all want to live good lives. We all want to live well. Uh, we all want to achieve what they call eudaimonia, which is kind of like true happiness or something like that. And the question is, in what does that consist and how do we get there, right? So the different uh, ancient ethical schools had uh, different accounts of what the end is. So Aristotle emphasized virtuous action. Um, the Epicurus emphasizes pleasure, uh, the Stoics emphasize virtue as a good state of the soul, we're coming to them. And the question then is always, um, the, 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 the goal is to get a clear sense of what it is that actually makes our lives good. And once we've got that, we've got something like a target uh, to aim at in our lives, and we're more likely to hit the target if we have a clear idea of where it is. And we aim for it, and, we, and these schools would think, you know, how do we, how do we get there? Right? What do we do? How, if the goal is pleasure as the Epicureans claimed, then how do we, how do we live pleasant lives, right? How, what, act, what way of living will actually result in a life that is as pleasant as possible as a whole? Uh, and that requires actually a lot of hard thought and a lot of difficult decisions. And uh, so, uh, so there's one question, what is, what is the goal? The, the highest good, the summum bonum in the Latin. And the second is, you know, how do we, how do we get there? And so these different schools had different views in answer to those questions, but um, they all thought that it's important to have a clear sense of what the goal is. Uh, uh, thank you for that, Mark. Um, Dan, did you want to, to weigh in on that as well? I think what Mark said is very helpful. Um, so, the, sorry, the question was specifically about the purpose of avoiding, of uh, enduring hardships on the Epicurean account um, or? The question was qu uh, quite a general one. What is, um, how important is purpose or direction in living a good life? Uh, right. is, do we need to have 
this, uh, as Mark says, this sumum bonum, this, you know, this greatest good in order to direct our energies and our efforts are, uh, toward it and know whether or not we've hit or missed the mark. Um, or is it more episodic? Could we just say, does, uh, is it just, well, in this moment, this, this would make me feel more painful than pleasurable, and so I, I, I opt for that. Um, but it may not have a, a holistic sense of, um, of the good or, or integrity. Um, yeah, I think so it's a great part yeah. of Epicurus is, is that a problem for Epicurus or, or does, uh, or as Mark was uh, alluding to, uh, does their sense of purpose uh, meet that potential objection? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I see that as bringing out the importance of uh, practical wisdom, uh, deliberation, uh, it's called prudence sometimes. Uh, Mark talked about phrenesis a little bit about Aristot uh, on Aristotle's account earlier on. There's kind of a phrenesis equivalent, which plays a really important role in um, Epicureanism. And the bottom line is, look, nobody wants to do painful things, um, really. I mean, besides a masochist, I suppose, no one really wants to do painful things. Why do we do them? Well, in the Epicurean account, we do them and we ought to do them. Because later down the line, long term or longer term, uh, the purpose is you're going to have more pleasure and less pain. Uh, ditto for pleasure. Nobody wants to avoid a pleasure. It feel, pleasure is great. Um, it just seems to be something that's good for everybody. Uh, why do we avoid pleasure sometimes? Not eat the super delicious candy? Well, because you're worried about your blood pressure or cavities or longer term pain. So it's that key element, that uh, incorporation and application of prudence, practical deliberation, practical wisdom, that does the work in giving you the purpose and telling you, nope, shouldn't endure, um, sorry, I, I shouldn't pursue that pleasure or I, I should in fact endure that pain. Thank you both for that. This just makes me think, um, moving along here, of, the sort of uh, the magnitude, the scope, and the scale of this pandemic. It's certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's global in, uh, in scope. Uh, the hardship that, uh, that we're all enduring is unlike really anything perhaps many of us have experienced before, certainly those who have gone through uh, the generation that went through the, the, the Great War, or the Great Wars know something of it, as Queen Victoria reminded us in her address. Um, but it makes me it makes me wonder about well just how much we can do how much we have at our disposal how much um, uh, is in our control to reach this goal to enact prudence to enact virtue to um, measure the uh, qualitatively greater uh, over the lesser pleasures so I'm just I just want to read this quote that I have from Herman Melville it's from the uh, the uh, book Moby Dick and he writes in this in this uh, section about making this this transition and a fairly abrasive one from the pleasantries of uh, of, of a life that he knew to the pains of a life forced upon him and he writes the following when I go out to sea, I go as a simple sailor, right before the mast, plumb down into the forecastle, aloft there uh, on the masthead. True, they rather order me about some and make me jump from spar to spar like a grasshopper in a May meadow. And at first, this sort of thing is unpleasant enough. It touches one's sense of honor, particularly if you come of an old established family in the land. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from the schoolmaster to the sailor, and requires a strong decoction of Seneca and the Stoics to enable you to grin and bear it. So what, I, what I'm wondering now is, given our own very keen transition into the hashtag lockdown life, how might a decoction of the Stoics, or Aristotle, or Epicurus, for that matter, enable us to grin and bear these unpleasant enough realities of this lockdown life, of the pandemic realities? That is, more generally, how should we bear the pains 
of these misfortunes. Right, thanks, James. Um, so I'm just gonna speak here a little bit about how, uh, how Aristotle would um, describe our approach to enduring the, these difficulties, these, these challenges, these ups and downs quite literally captured in the passage you read. Um, so for Aristotle, virtue is global and it's stable. What does that mean? So it, it's global in the sense that it applies to every facet of your life. Uh, so it applies not just the way that you interact with people virtually in this format, it applies also to the way that you interact with people in, in person, um, even if there aren't many examples of that these days for many of us. Um, it applies to your actions in any, any state, any um, situation, so whether you're relaxed or if you're in a state of urgency, you're you know, feeling very patient, angry, impatient, whatever the case is, uh, whatever is happening around you, the, the virtue remains um, in every facet and, it, and it's stable here. So I'm kind of drifting into the second element I want to talk about. Um, the reason that Aristotle's virtues, uh, I think are particularly applicable and helpful, especially in the, in the tough times, is that they aren't the things that uh, just pop out of existence spontaneously or suppose pop into existence spontaneously. You've got generosity, wit, temperance, prudence. You have these character traits, these good character traits, uh, and, and they remain with you. Why is that? So you, you've acquired them on Aristotle's account, not just by thinking about them, uh, not just by you know, sitting and, and reading and, and thinking about uh, virtue. You get out there and you act according to um, what you've decided is the mean relative to you between too much and too little in whatever sphere of action it is. So for example, with courage, uh, it might be precisely the fact that you have encountered difficulties and hardships and you are encountering difficulties and hardships right now that you can decide, okay, here's what the mean, the middle relative to me is between too much and too little. Here's the way I ought to act. My reasoning faculty, my capacity to reason is telling me this is how to act, this is how to aim at the mean, the middle. And if it weren't for the hardship, it might not be impossible to tell, but it's probably gonna be a lot tougher to tell uh, what exactly that middle is. So more concretely here, for example, you might think during a period of isolation, uh, you can just sort of cut everyone off and, and not bother with your social interactions, or you can start you know, doing Zoom calls every single minute of your time off work um, every day. Uh, and the, the middle, the right course of action for Aristotle, the virtue acquiring course of action, if you like, is gonna be one that's not relative to those objects themselves, that is like literally every minute or no minutes at all, not the arithmetic mean relative to that. It's acting according to the middle, the mean relative to you, to me. So I might think that, you know, I could just start messaging literally everyone on my Facebook list, just go down the list, you know, um, all, uh, you know, three people on my Facebook friends list. Um, and I might, uh, decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start pestering these people nonstop. I might also think I'm just going to, you know, just going to do me completely. I'm, I'm going to do nothing but um, cultivate my own uh, self-reliance in this period. Well, the right course of action for Aristotle is going to be something where I'm aiming at the, the middle relative to those, those two um, extremes, if you like, too much and too little. Um, and yeah, just to emphasize again, they're global, they're stable, and I guess all of this is a lot easier said than done, but that's kind of exactly the point for Aristotle. It's that to get these virtues, you've got to act on what you decide is the right thing to do, not just, not just talk about it. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. So um, the um, ancient Hellenistic philosophical schools, Daniel mentioned this earlier, today. So the Greek speaking world under Alexander the Great and the Macedonian, following the Macedonian conquests. They, they, these 
people were familiar with hardships, right? They knew plagues, uh, they knew wars, and a large part of the appeal of Stoicism and Epicureanism in antiquity was their teachings around dealing with severe hardship. Uh, so I'm going to talk now about the Stoics a little bit. Uh, so um, one of the great appeals of the Stoic philosophy, uh, I, I think, is the way that it uh, teaches us um, that uh, we are immune to certain kinds of misfortunes, that they don't ultimately uh, affect our happiness. And the, the, so the Stoics were a Hellenistic philosophy, philosophical school, started in the, among the Greeks and were enormously influential for many centuries, including among a number of prominent uh, Romans, such as Cicero, Seneca, uh, mentioned in the passage from Melville, and Marcus Aurelius, the emperor. So these Stoics taught that the only things that matter for your happiness in the end are, um, it, it's, it's the quality of your own soul, your own virtue. Uh, and virtue is sufficient for happiness. If you're a good person, uh, if you have a good character and a good soul, then that's all that matters. It's its own reward and nothing beyond that um, can, can stop you from being happy. And that's because nothing that anyone else does to you or circumstances do to you can take away your virtue. None of those things can make you a bad person. Uh, at least they can't do that unless you let them get to you. And you shouldn't do that. Your enemies can do terrible things to your body, but they can't harm your soul. So the passage James quoted mentioned uh, grinning and bearing it. Uh, it's not even quite like that for, for the Stoics, um, honestly. Um, so the first thing the Stoics will say, um, you know, and I say that it's not you can endure these things, but it's not just bearing it. You, they just don't affect you at all. So the first thing uh, to remind yourself of if you're a Stoic is that something like this virus, COVID-19, um, it can't take away the anything that ultimately matters to your happiness um, because it can't make you a bad person, right, as I already said. Uh, nothing in the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune can do that to you. Okay, so second, so how should we endure hardship according to the Stoics? Well, um, we should focus on what we can control. Uh, so we can't control something like a global pandemic. We can't just, you know, wish it away. There's nothing I can do to make it go away or you can do to make it go away. Uh, but what we can control is how we personally uh, respond to it. Um, we can respond to it in good ways, in thoughtful ways and considerate ways, in ways that grow our own virtue, that move us towards a fuller kind of virtue, that express that virtue in our actions, uh, helping others where we can and where it's appropriate to do so. Or we can respond to it in bad ways. We can panic, uh, we can get angry and kind of rail against the world. Um, we can despair, we can fall into selfishness. Um, but um, the Stoics' point is that, you know, it's, that's the thing that's under our control. Not, not what, what does the virus do, but what do we do in response to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And it's in that the Stoics think that happiness can be found, because the virtuous person, no matter what happens to them, will always respond well to the circumstances in which we find themselves, we find ourselves. And one final point, the Stoics also took reassurance from the fact that as they saw things, we're just... Each of us as individuals are a relatively small part of the world, right? There are, there are billions of other people in the world. Um, we're part of a grander system that, than us. Uh, and the Stoics thought that when, sometimes we need to get a little bit of perspective uh, and think about how wonderful the world is and how um, each of us can play our own part in making, that a good, making it a good place. Um, so this is tied up with Stoic theology and their belief that everything happens in accordance with God's will and in accordance with God's divine plan. And for those of you inclined towards those kinds of views, that can provide great solace in this kind of time of hardship. And it certainly, those kinds of views certainly did have that effect for uh, the Stoics. But I think central to their idea is this idea that, you know, th things, things are sort of bigger than us and... Um, you know, we, we can gain a kind of humility uh, from, 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 from recognizing uh, that fact too. Thanks. Thank you uh, both Daniel and Mark for that. Um, this, uh, a question came up and it really sort of, it connects with our previous discussion on friendship and, and I, I think it's a significant one. 
Uh, so I'll pose it. Must we ourselves endure hardships to help our friends with hardship? So I, I, I think this connects with, uh, with, with what we're talking about because we want to know like, well, can we live uh, a life of tranquility, of, of relative ease, of, of pleasure, um, and then still be a good friend? Uh, that is, you know, do the thing of provide that support, that comfort, that solace to, to someone who's uh, enduring the anguish, uh, emotional anguish, the anger, um, perhaps they're, they're being a, they're not being as stoical as they ought to be, and and bearing these uh, these necess uh, necessary causes with equanimity. Um, so does one oneself have to know hardship in order to be a good friend uh, in order for them to endure hardship? So I think it's a very good question. Um, starting off with the Aristotle side, uh, I would say probably yes. Uh, some enduring some hardship is is crucial for uh, having certainly a, a virtue based friendship. I just have a hard time seeing how you could care about someone just for his or her own sake and uh, care about their suffering, which seems to be part of that, and yet never have encountered serious suffering in your own life. Um, now that's different from saying that you would have to be suffering at the same time as that person is suffering. Um, that might that might actually make it more difficult uh, if you're both suffering a great deal in the same way, the same time, same degree. That that might be might be tough, not to say impossible. Um, but I think this is just especially relevant given what more or less the whole world is going through right now and has been going through <clears throat> for the past four, five, six months um, in this pandemic, uh, because we're all really facing the same sorts of well, hardships just manifested in different sorts of ways at different times, but it's from the same source and all of it has very similar um, sorts of nature. I mean, just going to, to work in person is, is difficult. Hanging out with friends in person is difficult. Um, many people have lost their jobs. Uh, of course, there is just also the brute fact that many people have got seriously ill and, and died. Many people have lost their lives or lost loved ones, friends. Uh, there's also the constant lingering anxiety uh, and worry about what might happen to us, even if we haven't lost anyone close to us, um, for, for everyone, really. Um, I, I, so just long story short, I'd say for Aristotle, um, yeah, that, that sort of thing is going to uh, help develop friendships. Um, and just I also mentioned earlier on that he thinks that if one friend, if one person suddenly becomes way better off than the other friend, the friendship really doesn't have a basis anymore. Um, so we might take that to mean that it's precisely because you're encountering the same kinds of hardships or have encountered the same kinds of hardships that you can have a real friendship. Thanks. Thank you for that, Daniel. Um, you mentioned uh, folks struggling with uh, anxiety, this, you know, this really uh, pronounced sense of worry over what the future might hold. And certainly the future is one of those ideas that we might have over which we have very little uh, control, very little uh, to do with what turns out. Um, as, as Mark was talking uh, about the, the Stoic theory of theology and causality, that everything happens uh, of necessity from, um, from the, the divine source, we get the sense of uh, this uh, the sense of fate, and that we aren't perhaps in control of a great uh, a great deal. And and Mark uh, indeed uh, mentioned that that you know for the Stoic, we we uh, a lot of a lot of what we must admit is what is in our control and what isn't. And there's a great deal more that is outside of our control that is in it. Um, and when we we contemplate the the the, the magnitude of this and we feel this anxiety. Um, we, I, I wonder uh, to what extent a Stoic would think, uh, how they would think of, uh, of anxiety, and maybe Mark, you can comment on that. Um, but I think the, 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 the fundamental question here is in connection with happiness, if this eudaimonia, if this, you know, this sense of flourishing or uh, reaching the summum bonum, uh, you know, living the virtuous life is, is, the, is the, the goal. How much of what is essential to our happiness is, is actually under our control? And how much is vulnerable to circumstances beyond our control? 
Can we still be happy in such seemingly unhappy circumstances as this? So really this is about like, how, how can we manage that, that emotion and perhaps truly be happy when so much, uh, so much is out of our control and outstrips our ability to, uh, to manage? Thanks, James. Um, just starting with the Stokes very briefly, Daniel's going to talk about them again in just a moment. Uh, you know, they would say, look, there's nothing, you know, because uh, a happiness is completely within our control and depends on the things that are within our control, but we don't need to feel anxious about what the world does to us because we can always respond well if we're virtuous. And so there's a sort of, this is idea that happiness is within our control, but I'll leave that for Daniel. Um, uh, so I'm going to speak very briefly in, for, about both Epic, Aristotle and Epicurus in response to this question. Um, so the question is, can we be happy in such unhappy circumstances? And the answer that both uh, Aristotle and the Ep Epicureans gave to this question is, yes, absolutely we can. Uh, so in, despite all the many differences, the ancient Greek philosophical schools would all have answered yes to this question. So. Uh, for Aristotle, yeah, it's a little complicated, but uh, his view was that the most important determinants of our happiness are within our control. Uh, because we can, over time, uh, shape and improve our characters. And because if we have the virtues and we have the virtue of practical wisdom, uh, we will respond as well as anyone can to the situations uh, in which we find ourselves. Now, for Aristotle, we're not completely immune to fortune. So, uh, Aristotle uh, famously sort of disagreed with the Stoics and Aristotle's followers disagreed with the Stoics over the question of whether a person can be happy even when they're being tortured, right? And Aristotle thought it's just kind of crazy to say you can be happy when you're being kind of stretched on a torture machine on the rack, as they said. And the, but the Stoics embraced that conclusion and said, yeah, you can be happy even then. Um, so still, for Aristotle, under a wide range of circumstances, for all kinds of reasons, uh, yes, we can be happy because our happiness depends on acting in accordance with the virtues. Step one, develop the virtues, become a good person. Step two, act in accordance with the virtues. Now, circumstances can diminish our opportunities to do that, but in very few circumstances will they take away our opportunities to act in accordance with the excellences of character that we have developed entirely. Uh, for the Epicureans, yes, we can still be happy under the present circumstances. Now, it's true the Epicureans uh, identified pleasure as the sole thing that makes a human life good. And there are certain kinds of things we enjoy that we can't do temporarily uh, right now. Uh, however, um, the Epicureans, as I've already mentioned, emphasize uh, limiting and training our desires so that what we want to do is those things that are relatively easy to acquire. Uh, now, sure, we can take other things when the opportunity is there. We can go out for the luxurious meal or go out to an expensive show and enjoy that. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's all great. And the Epicureans say you can do that. But what you need to do is avoid needing these things such that when they're taken away from you, you feel the pain of their absence. And so the Epicureans would say, in some ways, this is an opportunity to reflect on what, what we really need uh, to be happy. And maybe that's a little simpler. Uh, than some of us have, have come to believe. Uh, and uh, so, and, and once we recognize that these things are relatively easy to acquire, the things we really need to be happy, um, that gives us a kind of peace of mind because we know that circumstances can't take those things away as easily as it can take away going to the movie theater or something like that. Uh, and the Epicureans also said, we can focus our attention on the good things in our lives. We can pull the right comparisons right? So we don't dwell on what we've lost, but rather we dwell on what we have. And we dwell on what we've had in the past and the good things that lie in our futures. And finally, we can take pleasure to bring us back to the beginning of the session in the company of our friends. Uh, so that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so about this uh, question about control, like can we really control um, things and, and be happy despite misfortunes, despite difficulties and challenges? Uh, so first of all, about the Stoics. So Marx uh, nicely described how the, the Stoics think that uh, virtue is sufficient for happiness. In other words, you got virtue, you have all the, the good character traits, they're stable within you and so on. You've got happiness. 
and come whatever bad weather, whatever misfortune, you're good, you're happy. Uh, I think probably the most natural question and response is what about all the awful things that happen to us on a daily basis? I mean, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and, and also just, I don't know, uh, people who might, you know, make your life a little bit difficult on a daily basis or everything up to having um, COVID symptoms and having to be, you know, hospitalized and having your, your life on the line. I mean, all kinds of things can happen to you. And a lot of them, we would say, make it a lot more difficult to be, to be happy. Uh, conversely, what about all the wonderful things? What about somebody whose company you just love? They just make you laugh a lot. And, or, or what about, you know, just happening on the kind of uh, work that you love to do and that uh, just comes naturally to you that you really are passionate about. Uh, well, we, we might say as well that, that that helps you to be happy, but this stuff is not in your control, at least not much. Uh, whatever talents you're born with, I, you know, no one chose to have a certain set of genetics and so on. So if, if that affects our happiness, then how can the Stoics say that virtue is sufficient for happiness? Well, the Stoics basically are going to say these things can help. Uh, some of the Stoics, like Seneca, compare it to a favorable wind for a good sailor or beautiful flowers uh, popping up in a, in a farmer's fields, in a good farmer's fields. So a very good sailor, she might have no trouble getting home uh, with a favorable wind. She'll find a way home with bad, with, with unfavorable winds as well. Um, but the, the good things in life, like the favorable wind, will help. It'll help her to be happy. So having the good things in life will, will help you to be happy. And the misfortunes are going to, in some cases, make it more difficult. Um, but you can still be happy if you acquire virtue. I think it's a relatively plausible thought that uh, ultimately the, the main elements of happiness are in our control, but it's going to be a fair bit easier if you're lucky, and it's going to be more difficult if you are unlucky um, to be happy. Uh, so again, this is all consistent with the claim that virtue is sufficient uh, for happiness. I just want to add, um, so basically for the Stoics, yes, happiness is under our control, um, but with this important caveat that you know, misfortunes make it harder, fortunes make it easier. For Aristotle, I think in contrast, there's, there's less of a control element. At least my view is that for Aristotle, um, we ought to... Uh, use reason to acquire virtues, these global stable virtues, courage, temperance, wit, prudence, and so on, generosity. But uh, whether you have a good upbringing, um, whether you have um, you know, things that are just uh, more, more fortunate than, than others, maybe you just you, you live in a time when it's easier um, to acquire virtue, whatever the case is, that isn't really up to you, and that might just make it easier uh, or harder to to acquire happiness. Um, so that's right, rightly or wrongly, I think that's what Aristotle's view is about control and happiness, that it's not really entirely up to us. M much of it is, but not all of it. Um, and in contrast with the Epicureans who like the Stoics do think that yeah, it's all, it's all more or less under our control as long as you have modest desires and use practical wisdom applied to their brand of hedonism aiming just at pleasures in the absence of pains. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks a lot for listening. Okay, I'll, I'll just end with, uh, perhaps we, you can uh, answer just one or two more questions. Uh, a question that uh, we're getting here from Claire is that what would Epicurus say if an individual felt they had run out of opportunities to obtain pleasure? Would life lose meaning in that situation? Um, what would Epicurus advise us to do? So. This makes me think of Seneca in on Providence talks about how well if we if we live this sort of tranquil life, fortune favors us. We never really get to test what we can do, how we can, how we would uh, measure up to the hardships that are available to us. And in fact, that is uh, that's how we really test what, uh, our virtue and whether or not we we have it in in reality. But given what you've said about Epicurus. Even though, uh, as Mark was saying, it's about you know choosing those things, those those pleasures that you know that we can uh, that we can uh, obtain in any case. 
uh, perhaps this is still a legitimate worry. Uh, what if we find ourselves, or you know, uh, Epicurus or, or Aristotle, and we find ourselves in this um, in this woeful state where uh, we we have this luckless existence, and and you know, we just you know meet one hardship after another. Um, is happiness still a choice that we that we have uh, for ourselves, or or are we just perhaps cursed? Is it beyond our control? Maybe we'll we'll just end uh, with with your answering uh, this question. Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know, for Epicurus, the highest form of pleasure is found in the freedom from pain and anxiety, right? So, this kind of tranquility or peace of mind. Um, and so, the thought is that you can um, attain that uh, without needing to have sort of constant positive sources of pleasure in your life. And that's part of what, as Daniel said makes it the case that for the Epicureans, your happiness is, does lie within your control. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the main uh, thing to say, that it's tranquility in the absence of pain that is the highest form of pleasure. And maybe we can make sense of that idea by thinking just this you know, awareness that I have everything I need. It gives you a kind of, it, it leaves you at rest, and a, that's a kind of happiness, and that's the highest thing we can have for Epicurus. Daniel, did you want to weigh in or 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 abstain here? Yeah. So uh, the, the question was directed at the Epicureans specifically, or also the Stoics. Uh, it was it was directed uh, at Epicureans specifically, but uh, given what you said about Aristotle and how much might just be up to happenstance, perhaps you'd, you'd like to comment on that. Yeah. I mean, the way I put it is probably uh, maybe clumsy and a little bit careless in some respects, but for Aristotle, uh, it does seem to be the case that. We, we can aim to acquire virtues and we can aim to avoid vice. We can find the middle between too much and too little um, in our uh, actions, using always our reasoning capacity to guide our actions. Uh, and you might think this sounds like whatever, whatever comes, uh, you, you're, you're good, you, you can acquire happiness, um, you, you can acquire all of the virtues. Um, it's not clear that's true. And I think there are two main ways to take that. You might say, well, that's terrible. Does, does, is his view just that some people can just never be happy? I mean, that sounds like an incredibly pessimistic, harsh view. I mean, does it just turn out that everyone you know, born or everyone who grows up in a pandemic or something can't have as good a childhood as someone who didn't have that childhood, who had a childhood where they could go to summer camps and all that without worrying about this? Well, I mean, I guess that's that's one way to take. Another way would be to say that Aristotle is attentive to the fact that some people just do come from more fortunate backgrounds um, than others. Uh, I guess my own personal view would be something like uh, I want to incorporate some aspects of Aristotle's view, uh, like I think the use of reason, uh, aiming at moderation relative to you. I think that's really useful. Um, but I also like the control aspect of the Epicurean and Stoic accounts, um, where they, they do argue that even despite you know, all kinds of misfortunes, which would include a, a bad or an unfortunate upbringing with some you know, unfortunate role models and whatever the case may be, you still have control over your own happiness such that you can do the sorts of things that, will, that are sufficient for your being happy. Um, so that's my own kind of hybrid uh, mixed view, I guess, taking some elements from all the stuff we've been talking about, but uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question, and yeah, thanks for asking it. Uh, well, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Mark. I think that concludes uh, our, our webinar, our session for today. I hope you found it edifying um, and, and uh, certainly food for thought. Um, we will be uh, back again next week, Wednesday, talking about uh, some William James and uh, what goes into making a decision, a good decision, and how we might think about risk management, uh, especially the pertinent questions as we look to reopen from this uh, miserable lockdown that we've been, uh, that has been uh, forced upon us. Uh, but thank you all uh, for coming. Thank you for your, your uh, participation, and I uh, wish you a good night.